all fly away. You know, I've heard that song off and on for several years, and it never meant so much to me as it, as it does in this day, right? Because we can see as Christians things lining up. Things are getting in line for, for the time when Jesus is coming back. And people have been singing in churches and Christians have been singing for many, many, many for decades. And yet we're living in a time where those songs about His return are so real to us because we know it can be any day, right? And this is Palm Sunday and so... Um, how many of you guys like this weather that we're having? Raise your hand if you do. Oh, Charles, you guys yes, are you know. nuts. Yes, great. No, do you know that last year, I can't tell you what the temperature was, but you know in March last year it was in the 80s. It was. It was in the 80s. 84. And uh, now they're saying snow. And this is craziness. I'm so much ready for spring. I can't wait till it gets here. It was six days, remember last year, or last year, I can't remember last week, let alone last year. Um, last week we talked about Lazarus and uh, uh, how Jesus had raised him from the dead. And it was six days before the Passover. And Jesus returned to the house of Lazarus and sat down. The Bible says in John, it says, uh, Then uh, Jesus, six days before the Passover, came back to Bethany where Lazarus was which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead, and there they made him supper. And Martha served, but Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And that thought warms me so much that this Lazarus, that he went back to him, and Lazarus was able to sit at the table and um, eat with Jesus. But the Bible says that during this time, the word had got out. And many, many people had heard what happened, um, that Jesus had raised him from the dead. And the chief priests had already gathered and, uh, with the Pharisees to form a plot how they might uh, go about putting Jesus to death. And also, there was part of their plan was to put Lazarus to, Lazarus to death also. Um, because um, he was just kind of testimony and so many people had seen and believed. But Jesus knew that, um, or Jesus was uh, headed towards Jerusalem and he knew the things that he was going to go through. He had already told his disciples many times. He had tried to prepare them for what was about to take place. I like where it says in Luke, and this is uh, just a, a, a little one-liner, nine 51 that it says that Jesus has set his face toward Jerusalem. I like to say that he set his face like flint toward Jerusalem. And you know what we mean. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up. He steadily, steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. Have you ever seen somebody that has or know what we, can you see the face of Jesus almost think? Do you ever look at somebody and know that they are only thinking on one thing that you can tell by looking at their face, by the way they walk and, the, and on their face that they have something on their mind that is of such high importance that nothing can turn them back. And that's, and that's what we're looking at there because, you, you know, Jesus was headed for Jerusalem to, and he knew what was going on and he cried for Jerusalem. He wept for the people of Jerusalem. He wept for the Jews because he had come for the Jews. In Luke 13, 34, it shows you that his feelings and his heart towards them he said, oh, this was Jesus speaking, O oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, which killeth the prophets and stoneth them that are sent unto thee. How often would I have gathered thy children together as a hen doth gather her brood under her wings, and ye would not. And I would think that those things today, he could still say those things about some of us, some of the world now, because he is still the same Jesus that weeps for the lost. And he says, he says to the people and to all of the lost today and every day, if you would just hear me, I would be like that hen, hen who gathers her chickens and puts them under her wing. Like he has put us under his wing. Amen? 
We are not one of those who is, are lost. We are under his wings. Have you ever been, at, uh, been around a chicken? And, and I may have told you this before, but I'm not like... We didn't have chickens, but I grew up on this farm, and I always loved animals. And as a little girl, I went out to, um, to the horse tank, which we didn't have horses, full of water. And one day, I found a chicken in there. And this chicken was clear down, and nothing was sticking out except this little beak. Well, I saved it. I saved it, I pulled it out of the tank, I laid it on the ground, and I went into the house and I got my mom's good towels out of the bathroom, and I wrapped up that hen, well I didn't know it was a hen at the time, I wrapped up that chicken, and I took her out to the swing, you know, the, 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 the little bench swings that you swing back and forth, and I swang. I, I, I just, all day, I held that chicken until, all day, I held that chicken like a baby. And so the chicken was alive. And I went out and found a, a chicken pen and put her in a chicken pen. And I went to the barn and I found some baby chicks out there that may or may not have belonged to her. And I put them in that pen with her. And the next day I couldn't wait to get, uh, to get up and run out there to that chicken who then belonged to me, right? That chicken was my chicken man and I was its savior. And there that chicken was and I... Um, opened that pen and one of those little chicks uh, she was sitting on so many of them there's two or three out and I reached my hand in that pen to grab one of them little chicks and guess what she did she attacked me scared the boogers out of me she started squawking and flipping and picking my hand and I I went in I shut that gate and I went in and cried I, I just broke my heart but I tell you what that's how Jesus is with his people. He wants to gather us under his wing, and, and he will protect us. Amen. I am so glad that, uh, that that's where I am, as he has gathered us together. Jesus sent two of his disciples to find a colt of an ass. A colt of an ass. To bring to him that he was going to ride into Jerusalem. And I want to point out, or I want to just mention something that I discovered years ago, and, and it, does, it, it does good sometimes to think about it. As I think of those two disciples that were sent out, you know, to be in Jesus' presence and to be in his company at that time was a very honorable thing. It was a high... Um, it was a high calling to be there, to be one of his disciples in that, in that it was just so meaningful to be there. And yet these two disciples that he sent out to go into this village and to find this place and to find this cult and bring it back to him. And I thought about what were, they thought, what were their, their thoughts as they left the company of Jesus and were sent on this seemingly insignificant task that they have to be the one to go find that donkey, right? And sometimes I was thinking, what was their conversation like? Why do we have to do this? Why us? Why me? Why did he send us? Why is everybody else more important than us that we had to be the ones that, that he sent? such a, a menial task yet I wonder why it is, it is that he had to send me to do this but I want you to look and this is just an extra point I make I wanted to make it look at John um, this is in um, chapter 12 verse 16 what that says about that very thing and this is what it says. These things understood not his disciples at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then remembered they that these things were written of him and that they had done these things unto him. And you know what? We need to remember that today. What things, though, were they talking about? And I want to just point one more thing out to you. Zechariah 9.9, out of the Old Testament, a prophecy about this very thing. 
Zechariah 9.9. 9. And I will turn there. Give me just a second. And I got it. Okay. This is out of Zechariah. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Now when these disciples had said that they didn't really remember those things that they were doing or, or they didn't understand those things that they were doing at the time, but later they remembered them. And I wonder how many of us believe that right now that we are living in a great in, in, in a time where great prophecy is being fulfilled right before our eyes. And how many of us have done something that we think that maybe right now could be a menial, menial task, maybe an insignificant thing, and then we will find out someday or God will show us someday how those things that we were doing were not insignificant. Amen. See, those two disciples that were sent out to get that cult for him, at that time they thought this is such a, this is such a meaningless thing. Yet God revealed to them later that it was not. They, those two, all of the disciples, but those two dis disciples specifically were used to fulfill the prophecy of Zechariah 9.9. 9. Amen? Zechariah had said, and I don't know how many years ago it had been before that, that the king would come, and when he came, he would re be riding upon an ass and upon a colt, the f upon a colt, the foal of an ass. And these two men were sent to get that very thing that Zechariah had prophesied, prophesied about. Anytime I, I think that we feel like the Lord has asked us to do something, not, it is never, any of it, ever insignificant. It has a meaning. It has, it has something that he has intended to do. John says that the next day after uh, Jesus had had supper with Lazarus, he was going to, or he was riding into Jerusalem, the disciples had brought the colt. In John 12, 12 and 13, we've all heard of this before. It says that they took branches of palm trees and went forth to meet him and cried, Hosanna, blessed is the king of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. And so as he entered into Jerusalem with his face set like flint, Knowing what he was going to do, the people praised him. He had a great multitude. He had many people. And they were taking palm leaves and laying them on the path before him in their coats and laying them on the path before him as he rode into Jerusalem, crying, Hosanna, Hosanna. Great is the King of Israel that cometh in the name of the Lord. Yet, four days later, he would stand before Pilate and be sentenced to death on the cross. And many of those same people may have very well been in that crowd that screamed, crucify him, crucify him. Yet he went anyway, right? He went. And um, again, I, I say that to us when we look at it and we remember it and we, and we know the things that, that he's done for us, we need to, to dig in to what he really has done for us. He knew what he was facing, and he knew he would be crucified. And he, during that time, did not use his divine power to get through that time. He went in his humanity. See, I will never forget when I was yet a very, very young Christian hearing a man say flippantly, who probably never even remembers saying it, that it was no big deal what Jesus did on the cross, that he could have done it too. And because that he had the power of God, that if he had been 
had the same power of God that Jesus had in him, he could have done it too. But the Bible does not teach us that. What Jesus suffered, he suffered as a man. He did it in his humanity. When they blindfolded him, when they slapped him, when they spit on him, when they made fun of him, when they disrobed him, when they, when they pounded that crown of thorns in his head, he had pain in his head. He was a man. Him being the Son of God, 100% God, 100% man. But he still felt the pain. He didn't do it. He did not use his divine power to take the pain away from him. He was as all men feeling the pain. And it was not an easy thing to do. Yet he had that power. This is what we got to remember. He had that power available to him. Did he not? He said, I have the power to lay my life down. And I have the power to raise it up. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when, when they came to um, Jesus after he had been betrayed by Judas and Peter rose up and pulled his sword out and cut off the ear of one of the high priest's servants and Jesus said, no, 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 don't do that. Don't do that. Don't you understand that right now I could call on my father and he would send six or how many legions of angels to me? Look at Matthew 26, 53. Thinkest thou, this is what he said to Peter. Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my Father and he shall presently give me more than 12 legions of angels? That is around 10,000. Peter, don't you understand? Put your sword back in your po pocket or in your holster, or whatever you put a sword in. Just put it back. Don't use it. Because these things are going to happen. And these things are meant to happen. And right now, Peter, if I needed to, all I'd have to do is call on my father, and he would send more than 10,000 angels. Don't you realize that? Do you think, you know? And so we have to remember that when we look at the things that that Jesus went through. You know, when a man has to suffer pain, I think of a man in my, con you know, in, in the way things are now, or a woman, would have to suffer pain and he had no choice. Pain is pain. Pain is, is not a good thing and nobody likes it. And nobody wants to suffer that pain. And I, I think, I guess, like if you were in the hospital and you had something, some horrible pain, well, the worst I can think of for a man a lot of times is a kidney stone, amen? <laughs> and the nurse comes in and says to you, you're in so much pain, sir, let me give you a, a pain shot. And no one, no one is going to deny that. No one is going to say, all right, I'm just going to take, I'm just going to suffer through this. I'm just going to take the pain, right? You're going to take the pain shot to get you over the pain. Jesus had that, that at him as, as he went through these next few days. He was always able to call on his father and stop everything that was happening. But he did not. He took the punishment as a man. And so I would say that the beating that he took with the whips hurt. And to me, when you have the, when you have the power to stop it and don't stop it, we have to think of, of how great a thing that was that he did. I mean, we can put it, we can put it Back to, well, that happened 2,000 years ago, but let's put it into real life. Let's put it into real thing, you know, real time. No one can take that sort of pain when there's help and you won't take it. So when the thorns were driven into the bones in his head, it hurt. It hurt. When the nails were driven into his hands and his feet, it hurt. 
and yet all of heaven almost, I see angels holding their breath, ready at any given moment that Jesus would cry out for help. But yet, what do the angels want? They didn't want him to cry out for help because they knew was what was at stake, right? They knew what was at stake. Jesus told Pilate, to this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world. It was a purpose. It was the divine plan of God. It was not an accident. It was not a plot that some high priest gave him the credit and gave himself the credit for the plot that was able to put Jesus before Pilate and be sentenced to death. It was part of the plan from the beginning. In Romans, Paul says that the princes of this world did not know the mysteries of God because if they had known, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Why does, it, why does Paul say that? Because when Jesus Christ was crucified, that's exactly what the plan was. And here they were used as pawns in a chess game to bring about these things that God had already intended. Because Rome, or I'm sorry, Romans says, and, and, and I'm, not going, I'm not giving you the, the scripture, but you just have to believe me, it's in chapter 5, that by sin, and you guys already know this, but what, what, by one man, sin entered into the world. Right? We all know that. By one man, sin entered the world, and death by sin. That was Adam. When Adam sinned, sin, then sin entered the whole entire human race. And death is the result of sin. It says, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It goes on to say that through the offense of one, Adam, many died. And the gift by grace, which is free, came by the obedience of one man. And that was Jesus Christ. So sin entered into the world by Adam, and the payment for sin came freely by Jesus Christ. Romans 5, 8 says, But God commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So, so when somebody says, how do I know that God loved me? We could tell them, well, Christ died for you. And you know what? Some people will receive it and some people won't. But very few can hear it that they're not convicted by the Holy Spirit. Jesus had said that, the whole, that he would send the Holy Spirit which would reprove the world of sin. And what was the sin? This is the sin that they believeth not in me. And so God commands his love towards us. We can know how... See, we know that God loves us because he sent his son to die for us. It was part of the plan. It was part of the plan from the beginning. Jesus was the final blood sacrifice. The last one ever needed. The last one ever accepted. After he went to the cross and shed his blood for us, no more, there was never again another sacrifice. He was the final one. The Lamb of God, whose blood was shed that we might be saved. And that's why when Jesus said when he was on the cross, it is finished. You know what it is finished means? It is finished. 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 It's finished. It's done. The plan is done. It's done. The work is done. God became man so that he would be able to offer up his own blood for a sacrifice that was once and for all. 
that was once for all of us, right? Amen? Amen. I think that when Jesus took that final breath and his life then ended, I imagine that those angels rejoiced, the angels in heaven, for they knew what it meant. The world didn't know what it meant, but they did. And I can almost imagine that a tear was shed from God's eye. <clears throat> that his son had completed the task that he had sent him to do. Oh, he wasn't crying or he wouldn't, God would not have wept that his son had died. It would have been a tear of joy for because that was his final sacrifice. From that moment forward, from that very moment forward, and to this very minute when God accepted the blood of Jesus as a payment for sin it still stands it is still the only one the only way that it will ever work and that blood that he shed there was for the forgiveness of sins do you remember the thief on the cross it was for him and it was for those soldiers who run those nails into his hands and feet. Yeah. For the Jews that didn't believe. It's for all who have ever lived from that time on. For all of mankind. For you. For me. For the vilest of all sinners. Amen. Which I am. Right? For the worst of us and for the best of us, right? We still need the blood of Jesus. Amen. The promise still stands, does it not? Amen. And it takes me back to John 3.16 that we memorized or I did when I was just a little girl and went to Bible school the only time I ever went in my whole life. And I was so proud that I came home and I could, in just one day, I could recite that to my mother for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God so loved the world without What Jesus did for us at the cross, we would have nothing. We would be nothing. And yet, with that in our life, we have everything. We can do all things through Christ. There's no other way. And I think that many of us, I mean, we all know this, but sometimes don't we have to, we have to get a hold of ourselves and always go back to the cross. See, the cross is where it all began. And when we think of the time that's coming up, this, this um, week that is ahead of us, the things that Jesus would do, the things that he would say, the things that he would have to suffer. You know, Isaiah said he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Surely our chastisement, chastisement was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. We, he didn't just suffer a little. He suffered a lot in his body. But the cross itself was just a piece of wood. Do you understand what I'm saying? But it's the blood that he shed there. The blood that he shed there is what we have to keep our eyes on because that buys us every promise in this book. Right? It's the blood and we need to come back to the cross. And I think, or I would say that the churches need to, need, that we need to come back. That's where our victory is. That's where, you know, I used to say, because I was just ignorant and I ran my mouth. When... Uh, 
I used to say before I ever got saved that I just hated preachers with sweaty hands and sweat in their foreheads and pounding the devil out of people and everybody saying, do you need to get saved? You know, I just hated that. And then one day I realized I had been saved and I thought it was great, you know, but I always thought, what am I saved from? Oh, and I would say a lot of times I've been saved from me, from me. I've been saved from that. But the bottom line is at the cross and we believe in Jesus Christ and what he did there, we have been saved from the penalty of sin and that is death. And so we have that promise that everyone, when we stand beneath the cross, whenever you're in doubt, whenever you're going through a hard time, whenever there's times in, in, in your life, and there always is, how many know that we have these things that come up every day and we have to stand in our faith in the blood of Jesus Christ and what he's done for us. Right. We have to stand in that and I have to stand in that for you and I have to stand in that promise for my children because we can never take our eyes off that blood that he shed at the cross because the Bible says that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Well, what do you mean? Are you talking about my my son? Are you talking about my grandson and maybe they're not living exactly the way I think they should live? If they, whoever believes in him shall not perish and have everlasting life and that's not fair, is it? But you know what? That's our promise. That's our promise. And so his promise is for you and your children and your children's children if they believe that in, in Christ Jesus and that he shed his blood for their sins, they shall be saved. And I tell you what, with churches today, and I'm not being critical, but I am, they offer so much, and it's good. I'm glad that churches are growing strong, and they're growing big, and they have the multitudes going into them and attending their services, but are they just doing it because it's more of a, of a social club? You know, it's nice that they have basketball courts. Amen? And it's nice. Churches ha should have good things. I mean, we are privileged. We should have big things. But do their children know and their children's children and do, are they focusing that is all about Jesus Christ and what he's done on the cross. We should never leave the cross. The churches need to come back to the cross of Christ. And there's times that we have to go back there too because when we fail and we will, right? And we have and we will again and when we look to our own selves and our own work or lack thereof or all the things that we perform and do and those things can, seem to come short, there's one thing that never, never, ever comes short. And that's to be at the foot of the cross believing in what Christ Jesus has done for you. You know what? None of us are exempt from making some horrible a horrible mistake right oh yes I am I've got I've got Christ living in me I'll never do you know what we have Christ living in us and we also have the, the nature of Adam living in us also at the same time Paul says that they're contrary one to the other but what if a man who said I'm a child of God would go out and in a moment of rage hurt somebody if he's got his faith in the proper place, and that's in what Christ Jesus did for him, he will be saved. Amen? Without him, we have nothing. There's no other way. No other way. No other religion. Christianity is not a religion. It's about a man. No other religion. I don't care who they are. They'll never make it. They'll not see heaven. They'll not see Father God if they do not have their faith placed in the Son of Jesus Christ Amen. and what He has done for us. What other thing, 
What other thing could we possibly want? I'm closing. You can stand, please. What other thing could we possibly want from him? We can ask of things, and we do. And, I, and I'm, glad I have, I'm glad I have a father that will listen to me. You know what? But there's one thing, there's one thing that I am so thankful for, and I am just so thankful that I know, that I know, that I know, that I know. That I know. No matter what the devil tries to tell me, no matter how much he wants to stop me, no matter how much he wants to convince us that there's something that we can do to make God love us more, or that we have failed God in any way, or that our children have, or our children's children, I'm glad that, that, that the Holy Spirit is always able to take me back to the foot of that cross. And he can always say, just look up there. Do you see the blood? Bow your heads, please. Father God, we are just so thankful this morning that we have heard your word. Church, do you see the blood? Uh, he's asking you today. Look up. Do you see the blood? Do you see the blood? Do you see the blood, church? That's your hope. That's your promise. That makes you a child of God. That makes you a believer. That makes certain promises, exceedingly precious promises, are given unto us through what Christ has done. Oh, Christ has gathered you under his wing, little chicks, and he will protect you and He will love you. And He is the author and finisher of our faith. Amen. He started it in us and He'll finish it in us. Amen. He is the beginning and the end. Yes. yes, and it is His blood that cleanses us from all sin. All sin that we have ever committed or ever will commit. Yes. And His power and His strength that keeps us right there gathered under His wings. In the palm of his hand and no one can pluck us out. Do you see the blood? What are you going to go through this week? What are you going to go through this week? What, what will happen this week? What doubt will come into your mind? What fear will gather there? What question will you have about what's happening? What question will you have about something that you've done or fallen short of doing? And when that comes to you, just stop and say, wait a minute. I see the blood. I see the blood. Can you say that to yourself right now? I, I see, see the blood. blood. Brother Bob Landers, would you dismiss us in prayer, please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day and we thank you for your word. It's anointed to the pastor to preach to us. Yes, Heavenly Father, help us to take this with us, to remember it, and to rely on it. But this is the hope. Yeah. And Jesus, just be with us each one, guide and direct us, and bring us back together again. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs>